good to be with you, Covenant College. Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm, in, I'm impressed you're here and you didn't think break already started. Um, I don't have time to unpack this, but just so you know, today is a small snippet into the ideas I'm thinking about in terms of finitude, carrying on this conversation that some of you uh, know we've been having. So without further introducing, I, I just want to tell you, today we're going to be asking this question, what does God think of me? What does God think of you? And here's the text that's going to be in the background guiding this reflection. So listen to God's word, Galatians 2.20. I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's pray. Our God, the word gospel comes to our lips easily. The words God loves come easily. But would that truth become more personal? Help us to believe what is true and what is good about you and about us. In the name of our crucified and risen Savior, we pray. Amen. So what does God think of you? If you ask the, if you ask the average Christian, does God love you? We, we instantly say yes. Maybe even enthusiastically, we, we answer it that way. But I have found that if I ask a different question, it's more revealing. Because the fact is, I know, because I spent enough time with you folks, with my own heart, and with others, that while we say, yeah, God loves me, it's more complicated than that. So here's the question I want you to think about all day. Maybe I'll break. Does God like you? That's what I want you to ask. Does God like you? And I want to read you a story I'm going to read you a story. I've never done this before, but I'm going to read you a story, and this is by Alicia Zanoni. She's an alum of Covenant College, and this is her capstone project. So here we go. I like you, Samantha Sarah Marie. She was an English and art double major, and one of my students. Once there was a little girl who was little as a fiddle, her name was Samantha Sarah Marie, and it came to be one day that she needed a place to stay. So she moved in with a family who called themselves the Z's. Now, Samantha didn't know anything about her new family. She didn't know if she would like them. And more importantly, she didn't know if they would like her. What if she twirled and twirled so fast that she got dizzy and lost control. But Mrs. Z and her little brother Jack thought it was very impressive that she could twirl so fast and made a designated twirling area without anything breakable in it. What if she took too long to get up and to get ready in the morning and almost missed her bus to school? But Mrs. Z said the holes in her shirt were very confusing and they would have to practice a lot so she could get really good at not getting stuck. What if they liked very, very quiet car rides? But Mrs. Z said her music was beautiful, and unless she was making a phone call, then Samantha Sarah Marie had to make a bubble with her cheeks and just breathe through her nose. What if she got carried away when she was coloring and colored on the walls a little bit? But Mrs. Z said it was a shame the paper was so small and they would have to get a big roll of it. 
but. But in the meantime, Samantha Sarah Marie would have to use her strong muscles to wipe off the wall. What if she didn't want to eat her vegetables or her crusts? But Mrs. Z said they would compromise. She still had to eat all her vegetables to get big and strong. But Mrs. Z cut the crust off her sandwich in the shape of a heart. One night, as Mrs. Z was rocking her to sleep, she said, I'm really glad you're here, Samantha Sarah Marie. Really? She asked. But what if I get into trouble? Well, sighed Mrs. Z, I, I don't like it when you break my things or color on my walls. And it makes me very sad when you disobey and you yell and I have to discipline you. But that doesn't change the fact that you are so very special to our family. There is no other girl like you who has your spunk and your smile or your imagination or your laugh. Samantha Sarah Marie smiled a teensy bit. She thought she might like living there for now. Isn't that good? I could be done if you understand that. Part of what is so insightful about Zanoni's book is that she is pushing us to think afresh about belonging. She invites us to be more honest about our lingering fears about being liked, especially when our foibles and our failures are exposed. We wonder this not just about our parents and our classmates, but even about our Heavenly Father. Have you ever felt like, like your parents or your spouse, or your friends, you feel like they love you, but you wonder if they like you. Love is a, is a weird thing. It may surprise you, but when you think about it, love can be complicated because it, it can be loaded, a loaded word, with, with obligations and duty, which is good and right. But partly because of that, the word like can remind us of aspects of God's love we easily forget, his pleasure and his delight. Forgetting God's delight and joy can stunt our ability to enjoy his love. The story of Samantha Sarah Marie describes a little girl who surely was told that these new parents of hers, they loved her, right? But she knew they're her parents now. They had to love her. When you think about your mom and dad, you know, in a sense, if I say, do your parents love you? You're like, yeah, they love me. But if I ask you, do they like you? It tends to raise a different set of questions. Whether adopted or natural born, we all struggle with this kind of thing. And some of it's very natural. The very reality of everyday life, where children are inundated with with Com corrections and advice and demands plus their sins and shortcomings pile up and in that situation it can cultivate an instability and insecurities and then you add to it that as parents we can often project onto our children we project what we want to see rather than what stands in front of us some parents stereotypically they want a football player others w want a math genius some want their child to be popular. Others want their child to not need them at all because they're just too busy. And an insecurity can take root. Does dad even like me? Especially when I'm not good at stuff. A long-experienced youth minister recently told me this has always been the case, but it seems like it's getting worse. But it, it was reflecting with me on what he finds, especially, I think this is true in middle and upper middle class, but it's beyond, about the pressures for teens. And you can tell me later if you think this is accurate. But he said, for, for guys, teenage high school guys, you have to be excellent 
at one thing. It actually doesn't matter what it is. It could, be, it could be baseball, or chemistry, or computers, or Dungeons and Dragons. But you've got to be great at something. Young women are expected to be great at everything. They should get straight A's. If you're a baseball player, you don't have to get straight A's. But guys, or women, straight A's, you better look gorgeous, you better be athletic, you better be funny, you better be socially plugged in, and you better do all of that without looking flustered or out of control. Does that sound anywhere accurate? Any of you feel that? Thank you. (laughs) Now listen, being great at just one thing is enough to make most guys insecure. Thinking you have to be great at everything is enough to make, as I hear people say, it difficult to even breathe. There's a reason why self-harm among young people is on the rise. But I, believe, I recently read a book by Sh- Shania Nyquist, some of you may know, New York Times bestseller called Present Over Perfect. And her book convinced me this is not just a high school problem, it's not just a female problem, it's a problem for all of us. Although I will say I think it's even more targeted and intense for women right now. But these forms of perfectionism are not a joke. We can joke about it, but actually they have real physical, emotional, and relational consequences that can be crippling. Furthermore, our culture in the West is just this funny, weird thing, multiple personality. Because in the West, right now, we, we totally highlight rugged individualism. But we have far more of a herd mentality than most people realize. So on the one hand, on the one hand, you get exhausted because you're constantly told, be yourself, do yourself, don't let anyone tell you what to be, what to do, how to, right? Constantly told, it's exhausting, so you're like, okay, I'm going to do it myself. And on the other hand, you're suffocated with calls to conform. And so you have to, in order to be yourself, you better keep up with the newest fashion, the newest humor, the newest everything, so that it doesn't look like you're part of the herd, which just means you're part of the herd. And that tension to be yourself and and conform without looking like you conform, that tension is what fuels our economy and our insecurities. So in the midst of some of those factors, when young people are told, like Samantha Sarah Marie had assumed that she was loved, You can still wonder if you're actually liked. Do your parents like you? Do your friends like you? But the far more unnerving question is, does God like you? And I had to cut all of this out of my chapel talk, so if I walk over here, I see it's not in my notes, so it doesn't count, so I'm going to tell you something anyways. Theologically, for me, one of the biggest reasons it's cultivating this is when you've been told your whole life, you are a sinner, God is holy, God cannot be in the presence of sin, and so, you got a problem, right? But don't worry, thank God there's Christ. There's a lot of truth in what I'm saying, but watch this. Thank God there's Christ, so that God doesn't even have to look at you. He sees Christ. Now that sounds great when you're feeling the weight of your sin and shame. Praise God, he's not looking at me anymore with his holy eyes. That's a great thing. But the problem is, if you tell the story that way, without any qualification, without any... At some point, it will occur to you, hold on, does God even like me? Does God know me? Does God love me? Or does he just love Jesus? Do you understand what I'm saying? Or do you think that the Father, do we associate the Father with wrath and Jesus with love? So you've got Jesus saying, no, come on, you're with me. And, and so the Father is like this. Listen, I find Jesus, I find my son's friends annoying, but because I love him, they can hang out. <laughs> that, you think about it over the weekend, that view animates many of our lives. So let's check on Galatians 2.20. 
I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. In the life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I want to highlight three points here. And I'll just tell you, I'm going to spend the most time on the second. To be united, to be you, and to believe. Let's start with to be united. Central to the Christian identity is the union of believers with Christ by the Spirit. Paul says, I've been crucified. Christ lives in me. But here's the question. Who was crucified? Was Paul crucified? Christ was crucified. Now what's going on here, and this is Covenant College. I assume many of you know this. But if you ask someone like me or your pastor or other theologians around here, most of us, you say, help me understand what's, what's really important to understanding the Christian life. One of the first things we're going to tell you is union with Christ. It makes all the difference in the world. You're united to Christ. Now some of you are like, I read the New Testament. I don't remember seeing the phrase united to Christ. How could it be so important? But I'm just going to go quick. I'll give you a sense of this, right? Throughout the New Testament, throughout Paul, you, you find Paul says that you are in Christ. And then he says Christ is in you. He calls member, uh, believers, we are members of the body of Christ. He talks about the bride and the groom united. And so we are united to one another. We are those who put on Christ, who are clothed in Christ. We are those who are now in the Lord. We belong to the Lord. You get the idea? That's all about union with Christ. We are those who receive the spirit of Christ that we can cry out, Abba, Father. So John Calvin put it very memorably when he said, as long as Christ remains outside of us, if Christ is outside of us and we're separated from him, all that he suffered and has done for our salvation of the human race remains useless and of no value to us. If he is not in us, we are lost. In Christ, we are new, renewed creatures. Freed to worship and enjoy the Lord. So that when Christ was crucified because we are united to Christ, all of our sin and shame is actually crucified. So that now Christ defines us, not our sin. But he also says, Christ doesn't just die, he rises. And we rise with him. The last word is not death. The last word is not sin. The last word is not fear or terror. The last word is the first word. He is risen. And the risen one by his spirit lives in you and me. The creator is the redeemer renewing his good creation to be you to be you given we're united to christ by the spirit who am i we need to talk about the ego for a minute the i on november 17th 1867 charles spurgeon preached a sermon called christus et ego it's not about waffles and he's talking about Galatians 2.20, and one of the things that Spurgeon notes is, is that the, the first person singular pronouns, I and me, to use his language, they're swarming in this verse. And the plural is absent. Now, I will just tell you, and I know Spurgeon would agree with this, elsewhere, and I would actually say more often, the Apostle Paul will highlight the communal. He will highlight the whole. He will highlight um, the group the church, that is more defining. That is an important message for us today in our individualism. But that is not what he's doing here. And we need to stop pitting things against one another that shouldn't be pitted against one another. Spurgeon understands this. He, it, it, when Paul says that uh, he, he he's been crucified for me, right, his language here, he loved me and he gave himself for me. Does that sound selfish of Paul? Right? What's going on there? Spurgeon actually doesn't think so. He thinks this is a sign of true Christian religion. Right? The way I would pray, God's love through Christ by his spirit works all the way to the individual. He knows your name. The shepherd calls his sheep by name. Spurgeon says one of the distinguishing marks of the Christian religion is that it actually brings out our individuality. This could be problematic. But he says not, not our selfishness. 
That's an evil that God must cure and will cure. But, but we become more conscious of what he calls our personal individuality. Because God has given you particular gifts. We call them your gifts, but they're gifts from God. And he has made us all different. Here's this helpful analogy. Listen, this is the 19th century. So the science is a little, but it's fascinating. It's great. So here we go. He says, in the nocturnal, in the nocturnal heavens, there had long been observed bright masses of light what the astronomers called the nebulae. And they had supposed them to be stores of shapeless, chaotic matter until the telescope of Herschel resolved them into distinct stars. What the telescope did for the stars, the religion of Christ, when received in the heart, does for men women. Galatians 2.20. When Paul speaks here about being crucified with Christ, you have to ask who or what is crucified because the problem is I'm still here. My biology hasn't changed. My personal upbringing, my history, my skin color, none of that evaporates. The fact that I prefer coffee over tea does not disappear. So what died? The great reformer Martin Luther said it this way. He said, Christ abiding in me drives out every evil. Watch this. This union with Christ separates me from my sinful self. Beloved, stop acting like God makes bad things. He makes good things. And because he loves what he made, he won't let the sin remain. We have to be rescued, and we have been rescued by Christ. We've been given his spirit so that the true ego, rather than the sinful self, may live. Christ lives in me. Don't miss the second half. It's true. I've been crucified, all that. But then he goes on. I live. I live by faith. I live. Now here's where it's difficult. I think you need to be nervous when people like me get in front of you. I mean, for all kinds of reasons, but... <clears throat> because you know what? When, a, when someone like me or some spiritual guru or whatever, and we start talking about Christian spirituality, you know what we tend to do, whether we mean to or not? We project to you that Christian spirituality looks like our personality. There's been very interesting work on this, for example. An argument can be made that American evangelicalism, by and large, has been sold a form of spirituality that's put in almost exclusively extroverted terms. So you are told that if you really love Jesus, you better like being with big groups. You better like being with big groups and telling them your most vulnerable, intimate things and feel good about it. So the question is, if you're an introvert, Do you have to stop being an introvert to be serious and godly? These are deep questions for us. And introvert, extrovert, I I wanted to talk all about personality, not today. But the truth is we're different. You, when it says I no longer live, it's no longer I who live, that doesn't mean you have to stop being you. This is what's so tricky about it, right? Right? Some of us are publicly animated, others are more reserved, some are more adventurous, others enjoy quiet, some prefer reflection, others action, some like being with a crowd, some are rejuvenated by being alone, some deal with stress through humor, and others by focus. And the list could go on. Is one personality more godly than another? Now here's the thing, I know, hopefully not all of you, but I know some of you right now are thinking, you know what, Kavik, to be honest, you just sound like Oprah. Be you. So I'm going to just quickly tell you, it's not Oprah, it's John Owen. It's a different O. 
Puritan in the, ni- and in the 17th century, John Owen, is very clear about this. You cannot escape you. That when you are united to Christ by the Spirit, he does not obliterate you. He does not deform you. He does not deaden you. And Owen sees in the history of the church, sometimes this happens when we start to think about these things. We start to pretend that our union with Christ, and now this is Owen's words, the union with Christ destroyed the person of believers. As if affirming their union with Christ means they lose, this is Owen's language, they lose their own personality. They cease to be men, or at least these or those individual men. Stop hating being you. Owen says you've misunderstood who God is and who you are. No, no, no. The the point is not that you're all going to be the same. The point is that the vineyard of the Lord has many different trees. But he has, to use Owen's language, the self-same spirit. And the spirit will grow his fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, goodness, self-control, etc. In all the different trees. And you know what? It might taste a little different. It might look a little different. But it's the spirit who is the same amid our difference. We are not trying to run from ourselves. Christ has freed us from the entanglements of sin that deform and deface his image in us. Should you run from your sin? Yes. But you can't stop being you. And that gets tricky. All right, let me jump to the last point. To believe in him. Why is living by faith so hard? We're called to live by faith, a faith that we are found in the life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ. That his story becomes more determinative for us than our story. I think the difficulties of living by faith in the Son are related to two things Paul mentions here. First, he says that Jesus, quote, loved me. And second, that he gave himself for me. This includes the me with all the particularities, all the differences. Jew and Gentile, male and female, slave and free, young and old, clever and slow. Me. Many of us don't have a hard time with the idea that God loves the world. It's not, we're like, of course God loves the world. But I have learned, if you take even a mature believer and you look them in a sober time, like in a private, intimate time when you're having a conversation, but you look them in the eye and you keep their gaze and you say to them and use their name, Jesus loves you. Don't be surprised if they can't keep your gaze. Or if someone says it to you, Don't be surprised if a tear starts to go in your eye. And you want, why? We don't struggle to believe that God loves the world. And we don't really struggle to believe that God would die for someone awesome like Mother Teresa or Billy Graham or an orphan. But what about me? What about me? I don't even like leading Bible studies. I don't go on mission trips. I have hardly any money to give to the poor. What about me? The 16th century Heidelberg Catechism beautifully captures this message of the gospel. When it encourages God's people as they come and gather around what they call the Holy Supper. That God's people feast on. They show just how personal it is. Listen to this. This is all pre-enlightenment. So it's not just enlightenment individualism. This is in the Reformation. As you take the supper, it says this. As you should say. As surely as I see with my eyes the bread of the Lord broken for me and the cup shared with me, so surely his body was offered and broken for me and his blood was poured out for me on the cross. Later in that same catechism when it explores what what does true faith mean and that it's not mere knowledge it's not just knowledge and it's not even it's not even a general acceptance that God is kind it goes on to say you have to true faith has to believe that all that God has freely granted is not just for others but it says 
for me also. And that takes faith. Not just that he forgives generic sins, but the sins you did last night. The sins of the unkind things you thought about your professor this morning. Let me conclude. Who are you? Who am I? As hard as it is to believe, God likes you. And trust me, I know some of you are like, some of you are, almost seem just arrogant and no one will ever believe this. you just like, you're the gift to the world. Trust me, give me half an hour with you. I know the truth. I know the truth. I've been at it too long. As hard as it is to believe for you and for me, God likes you. He likes what he created. He likes his children. And he's committed to a renewal. God does not need you to be good at everything. He doesn't need you to know everything. He doesn't need you to be everywhere and to do every event. You can't save the world. You can't be the best. But you do need to be full of faith. A faith in the good creator who by his son and by his spirit is renewing his good work, liberating you from the sin that so entangles us so that we might freely love God and neighbor. You see, you are loved. God even likes you. He likes your spunk. He likes your smile. He likes the gifts he gave you. And he wants you to use them. And once you really start to believe the depth of his love for you, you and I might have the courage to smile just a teensy bit. Please pray with me. Help us, God. Help us to not excuse our sin and just say, this is who I am also help us not to hate ourselves. Help us to believe that you are a good creator who made us different, who calls us to different things, and that you are good and satisfied with what you've made. We don't have to become someone else. We have to trust you as our creator. Would you convince listener and speaker alike of your love and of your liking of us, that we might be changed. It's in the name of the crucified and risen Savior we pray. Amen. Have a good break.